Good morning. I'm Haley Repass, and I see some of you um, I want to get to serve in the nursery area here. And today our text is going to come from Acts. Uh, we'll be going 432 through 511. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that all they had, there was no needy persons among them. And from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it all at the apostles' feet. And then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have kept and lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money that you received? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died and great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Some young men came forward then, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who had heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm not sure that's the text that we would want to uh, read if we were just going to pump you up and make you feel good about yourself on a Sunday morning. Good news. A couple of people lied to God and fell down dead, and they had to drag him out and bury him, right? It's a little bit of a, a heavy text, but it's one that I believe that we need to hear as a church. Uh, up to this point in Acts, we've seen the work of God, the way Jesus Christ has been building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And up to this point, it's been nothing but wins, right? The church has begun to grow. The power of the Holy Spirit came. It fell upon them 3,000 in day one. The church has now grown to about 5,000 men and women. There are uh, powerful miracles being demonstrated. They're praying for courage and not for comfort. And the gospel's going forth. But then as this young church begins to mature a bit, they get a little bit older they, they, in, in their faith. They, they, they have some, some days and some weeks and some months under their belt. Something happens in the church in Acts um, that can very easily happen here. As a matter of fact, it's happened. If you're a believer here in Christ, I would argue that it's happened in your own life. It's a drift away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one reason that you and I are here today is the gospel. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ for us, which found every single one of us hopeless in our sin and in desperate need of a Savior. Now, sometimes I say words like that, hopeless in our sin, in need of a Savior, um, and there isn't always a descriptor with it. Like, we kind of think this is just a thing that we say because we're in church, and yet this week I, I was studying and I was struggling to study because I was burdened by the weight of sin and brokenness and pain and loss and death. It was like over and over and over, I was hearing the story of addiction 
or the story of someone who had died or someone who was hurting, someone who was grieving and, and just being reminded of this, the brokenness of this world and the utter hopelessness that we have apart from Jesus Christ. You go across our city, you go across our county, and you see people who are hurting. And we are gathered here today because we are the recipients of the good news of the gospel, of the work of Jesus Christ for us. I would argue, for the most part, we're in a good place here. And yet we have to be careful that we don't drift away from that unifying thing, the one thing which binds us all together, and that is the gospel. Um, John Piper says it something like this. I'm not going to quote him verbatim, but he says that basically a relationship with Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it causes uh, our love for people to be strengthened and our love for things to begin to weaken. As we continue to walk with Jesus and understand better who he is, what he's done for us, the gospel message, our love for people, it, it grows and it's strengthened and deepened. And our love for things, it just becomes less and less and less. And we see that demonstrated in the church here in Acts chapter 4 in verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. This is a, a Hebraic idiom. It was a phrase that they would have recognized exactly what it meant, but it's not necessarily as clear when we just read the words. It, it's, a, it's a phrase of togetherness. It's a phrase of unity. It, it meant that they were all for each other. They had all grown in their love for Jesus Christ, their love for the church, their pursuit of the gospel. And here you have this picture of a unified church. They're all in it together. They were of one heart and one soul. And not one of them claimed anything belonged to that anything that belonged to him was his own because all things were common property. Their love for people had been strengthened. And their love for things had been weakened. That's what was happening in the church. And it is a beautiful picture of what's going on. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord. Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. There wasn't a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as, as anyone had need. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is the work of God among people who spoke different languages, who come from all different sorts of places. They're living here in Jerusalem. Perhaps they were there to worship. The, you know, Pentecost happened. They're like, hey, we're just going to hang around. We're going to live here in Jerusalem. We love to see what God's doing. And so here they are gathered, all sorts of languages, all sorts of backgrounds. There are country folk and there are city folk, and yet God has done this thing. To bring them together in such unity, one heart and one soul, sharing all their things in common. And that was the church in which they lived. And they're seeing the gospel proclaimed day after day after day. They're being witnesses in the city. More people are being saved. But somewhere along the way, a couple of people lost sight of the gospel and somewhere, rather than experiencing that inner transformation of the heart that would cause us to love people more and things less, Ananias and Sapphira began to see their faith, Christianity, as something that's more external, as something that they needed to conform themselves to, not inwardly, but rather externally. And so we get uh, two contrasting pictures here in this text. Now, I'm just going to tell you, there's a really unfortunate chapter division between Acts chapter 4 and verse and chapter 5. I, I don't know why the chapter division's here. Uh, these were not obviously original to the text. They were added in later to help us be able to reference things. Uh, but you need to know that this section of text we're going to read, these two uh, contrasting stories we're going to hear are connected on purpose. And so in verse 36, we hear about Joseph. We're not going to call him Joseph because he becomes known as Barnabas. You hear quite a bit about him throughout the rest of the New Testament. But you have Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, translated means son of encouragement. And he did what everyone else there was doing. And he evidenced an inner transformation of his heart the unity that was displayed, the generosity that was going on among the body. And so he owned a tract of land, and he sold it, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' 
feet. And if Luke were telling a story, I think he would say, and that's exactly what he should have done. Man, God was doing this profound work, strengthening his love for people, lessening his love for things. It was happening in the life of Barnabas, and he's sharing his things with those who are in need. It was remarkable. But then we hear about Ananias and Sapphira, that rather than being inwardly transformed, they did the thing that so many of us do. Rather than the inward transformation, um, it was more about outward presentation. The longer you're in church, the more likely you are to start doing weird things that church people do, right? And so uh, I don't know if y'all under, uh, know this quite as much. If you've been around church, you, you've seen it. Um, we shake hands and we call each other brother. Hello, brother. You know, that's what you do in church. That's kind of something you learn along the way. And, and, and I remember as a kid, people would come to the front and want to join the church. And our pastor would always say, and we're going to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to them. And I'm like, what the heck is the right hand of Christian fellowship? I mean, I'm glad they're here too, but I don't even know what that is. And there's lots of funny thing that, things that church people do, and we kind of learn. One of the things that we do when we come to church is we put on our pretty face, right? We might have had a throwdown on the way here with our kids, and you get out of the car, and it's like, oh, we're all good. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Bless you, brother. Yeah, all right, right hand of Christian fellowship. Here we go. You know, like we put on a face because that's what we've been taught to do. Because church people are supposed to be joyful, right? And you're supposed to have kids that sort of mind you. And you're supposed to have a pretty good marriage. And you're supposed to be a, you know, a somewhat peaceful and enjoyable person. And so we put our smiles on and we go through these religious motions. But oftentimes we're far more concerned about what we're presenting externally than what's really happening in us internally. And I think it gets tougher the longer you've been a believer. We've had people stand on this stage confess addictions, affairs, and the really, really terrible things in your life. But something happens after you've been a believer for a while. There's this expectation that suddenly you get your life together. And that you manage your affairs pretty well. And that you don't have those big dips and fall flat on your face anymore. Over time, the longer we're in the church, the more likely it is that we'll be tempted to lie, to present something externally that isn't true of us internally. Look, look at what Ananias and Sapphira did here, in verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1. Barnabas had the field, sold the field, gave the money. Ananias, very similar, had a piece of property, sold a piece of property. You're going to see that he ultimately lays the money at the feet of the apostles, but there's something else going on with him. In verse 2, it says that he kept back some of the price for himself. With his wife's full knowledge, he brought the portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. And, and here's what Peter says. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? And, and he, he kind of asked him some questions like, Ananias, like, what is going on in your heart that you decided to do these things? In verse 4, he says, while it remained unsold, was it, was it not your land? Like, did it not remain under your control? And after it sold, was it not under your control there? Like, okay, you owned a piece of property. It was yours. You could have kept it. But then you sold a piece of property, and you could have kept all the money. But there was something going on in your heart that rather than God transforming you, Peter calls it the work of Satan, works in him to lie, not, not just to the church. And, I mean, he did present something outwardly that wasn't true internally, but lying to the Holy Spirit. Y'all, we might be able to convince men. You might be able to convince the person that's sitting in the row next to you or, you know, the person that you saw on the way in or the way out of here today. But God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And what he desires for you is not to live this life where you have to kind of manage the facade and keep up the, the presentation. But what God desires for your life is that you live in freedom 
from sin and that you can live out this abundant life in Christ Jesus that is fueled by gratitude because of the gospel that you have received. That's what God desires for you. And yet Ananias and Sapphira may be feeling pressure because they looked around them and the people were so unified. And not only that, the people were so generous. It's like they didn't care about their possessions. They're not claiming them there as their own anymore. They're just sharing with anyone who has need. But when they looked at themselves and when they were honest with what was going on in their own heart, they didn't see that same generosity and that same unity. What they saw was a little bit of selfishness and a little bit of greed. And rather than doing the most Christian thing that we could do, rather than understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ, which transforms our hearts, that Jesus, he died on the cross for all of our sin, our past and our present and even our future sin, they decided, you know what? Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do that thing externally even though that's not what's really going on in my heart. Rather than dealing with the brokenness of my heart, I'm going to kind of plaster over that with some outward religious deeds. And nobody has to know that my heart is full of greed. And nobody has to know that I'm not quite as unified with them. As I'm not quite where everybody else is. I'm just going to keep it to myself. I'll handle it. It'll be okay. So they went and sold the field. They kept a little money back for themselves. And they pretended to be in harmony with everyone else. And Peter looks at him and says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Not, not just to men, but to the Holy Spirit. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? Apparently, Ananias and Sapphira had recognized that there was a gap between what they knew God had wanted them to do or knew who they should be in Christ and what they ultimately were inside. They, they kind of recognized there was some distance here. I, I don't want to give all the money. I don't want to sell all my possessions. So they conceived this deed in their heart where they would present something outwardly that wasn't true of them inwardly. You have not lied to men but God. And as he heard these words... Ananias fell down, and he breathed this last, and great fear came over all who heard it. Now, to be honest with you, I don't know why God judged this sin in this way. I don't know why when Sapphira came up after, and he asked her, hey, is it true that you sold this land for such and such a price? And she's like, yep, that was it. I don't know why she also suffered the judgment of God in this way. But what I do know is that God takes our sin very, very seriously. I know that there is an extraordinary danger in us beginning to believe that Christianity is somehow outward conformity to a set of religious rules. There's something destructive and even deadly for us to settle for that. What happened here was hypocrisy. What happened here was deceit, and God dealt with it very, very swiftly, even harshly. You read the, the commentators, and there's all sorts of explanations for why God would have done this, and, and you know, how was Peter so harsh, and why didn't they have an opportunity to repent? Well, you know, why didn't God give more opportunity? And the truth of it is, is we simply don't know. But what we can know from the text is that God took their sin very seriously, and the same is true for us. Satan had tried to destroy this brand new church from without. The religious rulers had warned them, don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus or else. And the people, they prayed that they would continue to have confidence to boldly proclaim the gospel. So since destroying the church from the outside didn't work, Satan begins to work to destroy the church not from the outside, but from within. Let's destroy the church through deception. Isn't that who Satan is? Isn't he the father of lies? Isn't that what he did in the very beginning? Deceive Adam and Eve. And here in the church, Satan fills the heart of Ananias to lie. Not, not just to the people, but even to God himself. So 
today I want to talk to you, the title, the points here, what's the big deal with deception? We live in a culture that's kind of about appearances, isn't it? We like redo our, our houses and, you know, our, our lawn furniture and we have to keep our clothing fresh and presentable. Like, what's the big deal with deception? Why do people have to know if things are going on? I want to give you three pieces here. Um, number one, deception delayed their repentance of Ananias and Sapphira, and it resulted in their destruction. I spent much of my life, if you know much of my, my story and my, my childhood, there were some things that happened that left me uh, dealing with a profound amount of shame. And one of the things that I desperately wanted to believe about myself was that I was good. I felt bad, and so I wanted to believe that I was good. And so about my freshman year of high school, God began to work in my heart in some really powerful ways. I remember thinking, like, oh, my goodness, like, I'm not the same person that I, I, I used to be, and, and I know that it wasn't me. And, I, you know, my heart began to be transformed, and people started to say better things about me. I wasn't the, the kid that constantly got in trouble anymore. And so that felt really good to me. And somewhere along the way, I be began to believe in the mirage of my own goodness. I started to think, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't go get drunk like all my friends do. I must be a good guy. I haven't started smoking cigarettes or doing drugs or, you know, all the things that, you know, other people were doing outwardly. And I started to think, I must be a pretty good person. And the more and more I believed in that illusion of my own goodness, the less and less I could see the grace of God. The more I turned into this self-righteous person who would look down on other people just because they didn't maintain certain things in the same way that I did. And yet, my heart was full of sin. I could portray things outwardly that were not true of me inwardly. I knew how to pray for people. I knew like how to do the, the ministry thing pretty well. I, I, I knew how to quote the verses. I knew all the cultural standards that I needed to maintain so that people would think I was a pretty good person. And yet, my heart was being crushed by my sin and by my hypocrisy. And you know what that did? Believing in my own goodness... Convincing not just people outwardly, but even myself for a time, that I was somehow better than what I really was. And it cost me years of knowing the grace of Jesus Christ in my life and experiencing the power of, God, of the gospel to transform my heart and set me free from the very things that I was seeking so hard to avoid. For me, sexual sin was so painful. I never wanted to get into that. I wanted to avoid that at all costs. And I had all of these ways that I was going to avoid it. And so there were filters on computers and, and I wasn't going to have a cable at home and all the things that I could do to avoid sexual sins so that somehow I could feel good about myself because that made me feel ashamed. And so let's stay away from it. And yet, my heart was never free. I was working so hard to be good, and that weight, that pressure, it was crushing me. And then one day, I did the thing I swore I would never do. have a conversation. I didn't mean to. I wasn't pursuing it. But I have a conversation that was completely inappropriate with a woman who was not my wife. And the mirage of my own goodness was shattered. I couldn't pretend that I was good. I couldn't pretend I was a pretty good guy or a pretty good husband or a pretty good pal or any of those things. The only thing I could see was that I was a sinner who was in desperate need of God's grace. And it was in that moment and that realization that I found it. That I found the grace of God to be there. And that as I began to confess that sin before God, He was faithful and just and He forgave me. And I began to experience not a heart that was trying so hard to be good and fighting so hard against sin that had to manage these outward representations of my life, but instead I've experienced a heart that has been set free from sin. And I want you to know that that can be true of your life. 
that God wants to set you free, that we can be people who, because of Jesus Christ and because of the gospel, we love people more and we love things less and we are genuinely transformed rather than living the normal American life of outward hypocrisy. You know what the number one complaint we hear from people outside the church is? Oh, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Because as soon as they get close enough to our lives to see the real us, they realize that there is a big dissonance between what we say, what we present externally, and what's truly going on with us internally. What's the big deal with deception? It delayed their repentance and it resulted in destruction. You know what Ananias and Sapphira should have done? They should have gone to that church of people who are one heart and one soul who, were, who all understood the gospel of Jesus Christ that found us all hopelessly in our sin and that Jesus saw all of that and went to the cross for us to take away all of our sin and to credit to us his righteousness. Now, here's, here's the thing. If y'all heard the theological principle, it's the already but not yet, right? That means that we have already been made righteous by Jesus Christ, by his work on the cross. He died for all of our sin. When God looks at us, we are made fully righteous. And yet, we still live in bodies that are prone to sin. And so we're already righteous, but we're not quite there yet. We are growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we slip up and we fail and we fall into sin. And so Ananias and Sapphira, knowing that we're a work in progress, that God isn't finished with us, that he's continuing to, to grow us and to transform us, should have come before the church and say, hey, y'all, I see something that's deadly and destructive in my life. I see that my heart is full of greed. I see that my heart is full of pride. Would you pray with me? This is James chapter 5, 16. Like we, we talk about this over and over and over where James says to these young believers, hey, if you find yourself in sin, like gather some people around you, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. Don't try to maintain the facade. And go ahead and just tear it down. Let people see the real you. God does anyway. You're not lying just a minute. You're lying to God and he knows. They should have come recognizing this dissonance in their lives between what they wanted to present outwardly, outwardly and what was true inwardly and confess their sins and have people pray for them that their hearts might be transformed, that they too could be of one heart and one soul and giving generously to other people, that their grip on things would have been loosened. But instead they, rep they responded in pride. No, 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 we can handle this. I know there's a little greed right now, I know we're feeling a little selfish right now, but we'll, we'll pray about that later. Right now, we're just going to sell this land, and we're going to pretend that we're going to give just like everybody else, and we'll take care of this you know, when, you know, behind closed doors where nobody has to see it. They delayed their repentance, and it was deadly. We have a term in recovery. It's at the very front. When you begin the, any 12-step program or uh, celebrate recovery, here we have regeneration. You're going to deal with the topic of denial. That somehow we are masterful at deceiving, not just people outside, but also ourselves. Into thinking, I've got this, I can control it, I can manage this, life's going to be okay, I'll take care of it tomorrow. It's not that big of a deal. It's hypocrisy. It's deception. And it's deadly. And people for 10 years, or 15 years, or 30 years will walk in addiction, denying that they have a problem, pretending like everything's okay, trying to convince themselves and others, when in reality what they need is repentance. And they need people to walk with them. They need God to powerfully work to transform their hearts. It's true of them, and it's true of us. So what's the big deal with deception? It delayed their repentance, and it resulted in destruction. When I was a kid... I had an aunt and uncle, they sang in a gospel quartet, and they had an old cassette tape, you know, old school stuff, and I was a youth pastor when I was 19 years old, and I'd drive around in the church van, and I'd put that cassette tape in, and there was this song that would play that I thought, oh my goodness, that's so true, and the older I've gotten, uh, the more true it's become. They sang a song that said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, slowly but wholly taking control. It will leave you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you far more than you want to pay. 
Today, if you're here and you think about your heart and your life, and there's a dissonance. You know that you ought to be generous. You know that you ought to be loving people. You know that you ought to be in the Word. You know what Christ would desire out of your heart. But as you look into your life, you look at how you're actually living, you're like, oh, there's a gap there. Listen, pay attention to that. Don't hide it. Don't try to, you know, paper over it. But instead, do business with God. It begins with repentance. Tonight, as you gather with your community group, it's like, hey, y'all. And i got something going on in my life. I need you to pray with me about it. I need to confess this to you because I've got to deal with this. Our enemy is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. He wants you to keep it a secret. He wants you to try to battle it on your own. He wants you to keep up the false pretenses while inside destruction is happening. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it to the fullest. Don't settle for some cheaper version of life where you've got to carry the weight and you're being crushed by trying to be a Christian. And Jesus wants to set your heart free. What's the big deal with deception? Number one, it delayed their repentance and it resulted in their destruction. Number two, deception destroys relationships and it creates division. You ever been betrayed? You ever had someone that you trusted with something and then you found out later they didn't keep what you'd said to themselves or maybe they used what you said against you? Like, we know how devastating that can be. Relationships are built on trust, right? And if, if you break that, um, it's really, really hard to rebuild it. Like, it's, it's so painful. And, and, and then you, you, you begin to have, uh, I don't know, any interaction with them. And you're questioning, like, are they being honest with me? Okay, they betrayed me here. Or have they been honest with me in the other ways? And then you begin to be skeptical of other people, right? Deception, it destroys relationships and it creates division. One of the ways that this happens, happens even when people don't find out. When we present something outwardly that isn't true of us inwardly, slowly but surely we begin to isolate ourselves from each other. When we pretend and we put on a false front, we can't let people get too close to us, right? Because then they might see the truth. It's easy to fake it from afar, But when people get close, they begin to see the real us. And when for a period of time we presented a version of ourselves that isn't true, hello, brother, life is good, family's perfect, love my wife, walking with Jesus. When we're really dealing and walking through a great season of doubt and we're struggling with our faith, when our marriage is in shambles, When we've presented something outwardly for so long that isn't true of us inwardly, we have to keep that up. And it's exhausting, and it isolates us from other people. Community group, heck no. I can't be honest with people. What would they really think of me? And what we come to realize is that we're not truly loved because we're not truly known. Any love people would show us is based upon this false presentation of ourselves. They don't love us. They love who we presented Deception, not just the kind where you Bernie Madoff people and you steal all their money, right? But even the kind that comes in the form packaged in hypocrisy. Presenting something outwardly that isn't true inwardly. Deception, it destroys relationships and it, ke- it, it creates division. The final thing here is deception distorts the gospel. You know the gospel that Ananias and Sapphira preached? is that if you come to Jesus and you keep yourself clean, then you're going to be good. If you'll come to Jesus and you'll keep yourself clean, then you're going to be good with God. But that's not the gospel at all, is it? The gospel of Jesus Christ is that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we are weak and we are helpless we are slaves to sin but God found us dead there and he made us alive together with him on the cross Jesus Christ bore our sin and it was costly God poured out his wrath on his son Jesus my God my God why have you forsaken me but there on the cross it was finished 
all of our sin, our past and our present and our future, it was atoned for on the cross by Jesus Christ. And the gospel begins to transform us. And it begins to set our hearts free where we don't have to pretend before any men because men aren't our audience. We don't have to make ourselves acceptable and pleasing somehow to other people because they aren't our audience. We know that we have been chosen and that we are accepted by God, and so we don't have to perform for men. And we can be honest about our struggles and our weakness, and we can say, hey, I'm dealing with greed right now. Would you guys pray with me? Because I want true and abundant life. I don't want a cheap imitation. And I don't want to walk, like having to live this deceitful life, pretending things are great, when in reality I'm suffering. The gospel sets us free from pretense. You're already accepted. God has already approved of you. He chose you. He's lavished his love on you. You don't have to perform before men. And it sets us free to pursue true and abundant life. In him. The gospel of Jesus Christ leads us to repentance. We're quick to run there because we want to be set free. It brings about new life, it frees us from guilt and shame. The gospel heals our broken relationships, forgiving one another just as Jesus has forgiven us, and it unifies us together around the one thing that is true of all of us. We were hopelessly lost in sin but we have been miraculously and supernaturally saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. So today I want to ask you the question. Does your external presentation match what's really going on in your heart and your life? Have you been honest about your sin? Those Maybe there's small areas now, but you know there's greed, there's selfishness, There's lust. And it might feel small now, but sin always grows, right? Have you confessed that sin to anybody? Have you been honest? Maybe this question would bring it more clear. When was the last time that you confessed your sin to somebody who wasn't yourself? And you just laid it all out there, that you were truly known. Repentance for the Christian is an ongoing ethic. It's a continuing ethic. It's the thing that we do over and over and over as we see what God has called us to in Christ Jesus and recognize that we're not there. It's God, would you take that lust away? God, would you take that greed away? God, this is idolatry. Would you remove it from my life? And we trust in him, and he's the one that does the work, and all glory and honor and praise goes to him and not to us. Today, I'm going to say a word of prayer for you, and then I'm going to invite you in your heart, to begin to consider the dissonance, the gap between what God's called you to be and who you really are. And I just want to encourage you today with all my heart as your pastor who loves you to practice confession today. Find somebody you trust, somebody you know. Get it out there that God may begin this work of healing in you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We praise you for your love for us that is so extraordinary and so far beyond us that, God, it's hard to comprehend. Lord, our default says that we have to perform in order to be accepted. And yet, God, we know that we're we're accepted in you on the basis not of what we've done or not done, but on the basis of your work for us, what you've accomplished for us on the cross. So, God, I pray for this to be a place where there's no pretense, where we don't have to lie, where we can be honest about our sin, and a place where hearts are set free, where addictions are broken, where marriages are healed and hearts are transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, for those hidden things, even for the places where we may have deceived ourselves into thinking, you know, I'm a pretty good person. God, I pray that we would repent of that. And rather than looking at this really, really shallow version of our own goodness, we might see truly the goodness and the grace of God. Father, would you make us the church that you want us to be? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.